We've now reached the time for closing statements. The, uh, the order of uh, speakers is uh, Peacock, Ridpath, Vickers, and Kaplan, but the time is going to be divided into 10-minute uh, segments allotted to each side. I won't time the individual speakers. I will ring the bell at five minutes, nine minutes, and uh, stand up at, at the 10-minute mark. Uh, Dr. Peacock, would you like to lead off for the capitalists? I just want to say that I regard the welfare state as an abomination, as morally evil. I do not base morality on the Sermon on the Mount, and I do not put forth a moral case in terms of the lame, the halt, and the blind. I say, if you are talking about what mankind requires, what man or woman requires by her nature and his nature to survive, you have to first say, what does the healthy, unafflicted individual require? Because the weak, the sick, the helpless, by definition, cannot survive on their own. You cannot shackle those who are able to function, allegedly in the name of helping the weak, because then you will wipe out the whole human race. So if, quote, compassion is your value, compassion for those who can't survive on their own, the first thing that you should do is take the shackles off the people who are able to think and produce and create the wealth that everyone requires to survive, including the weak. What the welfare state does is exactly the reverse. This shift in direction that Dr. Kaplan talked about is precisely a gradual tightening of the noose around the necks of those who are able to produce, and the result of this is uh, increasing economic crisis we're oscillating just the way Nazi Germ uh, uh, Weimar Germany did between a potential runaway inflation and a potential depression. We have hordes of unemployed just as they did as a result, not of capitalism, but of all the government controls in the economy. If we have poor, and in the West, poverty is a very relative thing, if you go to the East and see what poverty is. But such poverty as we have here is essentially caused by this very glorious welfare state, which is undermining and making pro productivity impossible. Moreover, this is not a stationary thing. Every control requires further controls. It produces certain dislocations, which necessitate still further controls. You can check that by looking at history. Every single decade, it doesn't make any difference what party is in office, is, is in office has more and more controls to try to cover the consequences of the preceding controls. And there's only one end of that road, as there was in Weimar, Germany, and that is total control. This is the end result of the welfare state, which is only a transition point in history. Now, having said all that, I nevertheless despair of arguing on this topic, because I do not think you can argue about politics by itself. Politics is not a primary. Whether you are a socialist or a capitalist depends upon basic philosophic questions. Our opponents have already uh, appealed to the Sermon on the Mount and by implication have rejected reason in the suggestion that rationality is subjective and that one person's rationality is not somebody else's. So they have an entirely different philosophic framework, so it's no wonder that they are socialists. <laughs> it also happens to be the case that the thing is entirely rigged against us because the universities in this country and in the United States are entirely skewed in favor of the two ideas that socialism depends on, namely the rejection of reason and the insistence on self-sacrifice. That absolutely dominates. You can take the typical college graduate and see it very easily by asking him what he thinks, and as soon as you say anything, he will say, well, it's all a matter of opinion. Who can know anything? There's no absolutes, etc." In other words, he's been brainwashed to conclude his mind is helpless. Except, although you can know nothing, he knows one thing. It's bad to live for yourself. You've got to live for the society, for the poor, or whatever. How he knows that is presumably by revelation. <laughs> now, in, in my book, uh, The Ominous Parallels, I point out that this exact same intellectual situation existed in Weimar, Germany, and Hitler counted on it and cashed in on it, specifically on this kind of unreason and this kind of uh, intense commitment to self-sacrifice on the part of the Germans. And uh, the result was that socialism triumphed. Nazism is socialism. It's one form of socialism, and it...
It is that in theory, and it was that in practice. Let us define our terms. I, I, I think we would have had a definition of socialism by now. Government control over property. Are you going to tell me that in Nazi Germany there was such a thing as private property and free independent action? If so, you have never been there. You don't know what you're talking about. Only for the rich. Now, Hitler, Hitler was able to rise to power in Germany because he had no opposition. He had his liberals and conservatives just as we have in this continent. I'll just be, can I take one of your minutes? His, the liberals in Germany at the time said, let's have more economic controls. The conservatives said, no, let's have more intellectual controls by the government. And Hitler said, you're both right, let's have total control. <laughs> The only antidote to this development is somebody who says, let's not have government control. Let us stand up for the rights of the individual as absolute to his life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Regardless, he has no obligation except to live as a rational being. If, if we can't establish that, there is no hope. So my concluding remark is this. If you go to college, I don't ask that many professors teach reason and selfishness. I think a fair ratio would be one professor advocating reason and selfishness to 200 advocating unreason and socialism. If you would get your faculties to allow that ratio, just one to 200, I would have no fear for the future of the country. But unfortunately, they will not allow it. Okay. is, which is the moral social system. <laughs> we, we have tried to, to present an argument in defense of man's moral right to live his own life. We have tried to present an argument in defense of man's need for freedom, for man's need to have his rights respected. We have tried to present our argument, therefore, for capitalism as a social system which does this as the only social system that offers man this, that offers man the opportunity to live his life, and therefore the only moral social system. Had our opponents bothered to try and argue for their, the moral basis for their system, they would have had to have argued for man's duty to serve others, for altruism. They would have had to have argued for the moral appropriateness, and Professor Kaplan has admitted to this, the moral appropriateness of coercing men into the good life as the socialists see it. They would have argued for socialism as the social system where the government has the power to force people to live the good life. The issues, therefore, I think, are clear. We have argued for laissez-faire. They are arguing for state management. We have argued for the state as the protector of individual rights. They have argued for the state as our parent. We have argued for individual rights. They have argued for sacrifice to the group. We are arguing that we are not our brother's keeper and they have to morally rest on the claim that we are our brother's keeper. So now the issues are out and you must think for yourself. If you want to know my basic reason for agreeing to engage in this debate, it is because of my belief in the power of ideas. Ideas count. History is determined by ideas. Ideas will determine our future. True ideas will lead us ahead. False ideas will kill us. The Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the 19th century, the creation of the United States of America were all products of ideas. So as uh, this is also true for Nazi Germany, for communist Russia, for communist China, for slavery, for slave labor camps. These also are ultimately the results of ideas. I must say that I literally believe that the ideas that our opponents have propounded would, if followed, lead to poverty, slavery, and the destruction of civilized, civilized life on this planet. On the other hand, I believe that our ideas, if followed, can lead us to a prosperous and happy future. Thank you very much.